Hey guys, Coach Pop here. Thanks for joining me for this week's uh, video lecture. Today we're looking at Strayer's Chapter 14, Economic Transformations, Commerce and Consequence, 1450 to 1750. You'll recall that in this unit, Strayer is effectively making a case that the period should be called the early modern period. In Chapter 13, he argues that empires are a driving force of this new kind of globalization. In this chapter, he's going to look at uh, commerce as a driving force of globalization. And he begins in Chapter 14 as he did in 13 with Europeans. While we have seen that the European conquest of the Americas has had an enormous impact on the global economy, we must not forget that what motivated their explorations in the first place was a desire to break into the markets of Asia. Indeed, both Columbus and da Gama originally sought a sea route to Asia. So what drove European involvement in the world of Asian commerce? Above all, it was a desire for the luxury goods in general, but for spices in particular. Since the time of the Roman Empire, Europeans had developed a taste for the spices of Asia, especially for black pepper. Europe's population began to recover after the ravages of the Black Death, while at the same time European monarchs were developing more efficient means of governing. Moreover, after the Crusades and the travels of Marco Polo, many European cities, especially Italian city-states, came to rely on international trade. The existing trade systems also posed certain problems. Chief among them was the fact that Muslims controlled the supply of goods from Asia. Many European monarchs also resented the fact that Venice had a near monopoly on trade with Alexandria, the chief port of entry for Asian goods into the Mediterranean. The biggest problem Europe had, though, was the fact that it had nothing of value to trade with Asia, creating an enormous trade imbalance. Consequently, the Europeans needed gold and silver to, pur to purchase Asian goods, thus fueling the policy of mercantilism pursued by many European empires. While European entry into Asian trade may have had similar causes, the effects were quite different for the various empires. Under the direction of Prince Henry the Navigator, and thanks to Vasco da Gama, the Portuguese would be the first Europeans to enter into the rich and diverse realm of the Indian Ocean trade network. When the Portuguese entered the ports of the Indian Ocean, they soon discovered that their goods were not in demand, and they did not have the cash to buy the Asian items they desired. The Asian ports and the Asian economy as a whole were much wealthier than the Portuguese or other European economies. However, the Portuguese also realized that the Indian Ocean trade was generally unarmed. After the Ming recalled the fleet of Zheng Ho, there was no real authority in the region. Thus, they used their maneuverable ships and cannons to attack merchants and ports, taking what they wanted and establishing a series of ports for themselves as bases. The Portuguese took control of these existing ports in East Africa, the Persian Gulf, India, Southeast Asia, and China, thus providing a solid entry into the Asian economy. They also served as fortified naval bases to pursue their goal of domination of the region. Make sure you're able to locate each of these por ports on a map. Instead of attempting to seize large tracts of land, the Portuguese focused on this string of ports, created, creating what is known as a trading post empire. From these ports, they tried to create a monopoly by forcing merchants at the barrel of a cannon to buy a Cartaz Pass. While this did make them wealthy, they never established anything near the complete control of the Indian Ocean trade they originally sought. The Portuguese already knew there was no point selling European goods in Asia, and they soon realized that there was little profit in exporting Asian goods to Europe. Instead, the real money was in becoming a player in the existing trade system, carrying Asian goods to Asian ports. Moreover, many Portuguese men married local women and settled in Asian or African ports. Despite many successes, the Portuguese trading post empire was too large and too poorly run to have a long-term impact. Just as their influence in the Indian Ocean declined in the 17th century, other European powers began to make efforts to move into the Asian trade. Spain posed the first challenge of the Portuguese spice trade. As the Spanish saw that Portugal was, was generating wealth from this trade, the crown renewed its efforts to establish a trade connection with Asia, which was, after all, Columbus's initial um, mission. Ferdinand Magellan is frequently credited with the first around-the-world voyage. 
while the actual circumnavigation was completed by one of his officers, it nonetheless established Spanish contact with a large archipelago chain in Southeast Asia, where Magellan was killed. The Spanish would call this chain of islands the Philippines after King Philip II. The Spanish soon realized that these islands could serve as an entry point into Asian trade. As the islands had no central government and the Spanish came in with the force of gunpowder and the pageantry of the Catholic Church, they were able to win over many local leaders. The result was a relatively peaceful conquest. The Spanish were extremely successful in spreading the Catholic faith, making Filipino society the only major Christian outpost in Asia. However, Muslim merchants had recently introduced Islam to the people of a large island in the south called Mindanao. As this area resented Spanish rule and the spread of Catholicism, Islam served as an ideology of resistance. The Spanish did not follow the Portuguese example of a trading post empire. Instead, they colonized the Philippines in a manner similar to the Americas. Large estates, forced relocation, unpaid labor, and tribute all disrupted traditional Filipino culture and society, especially the status of women as ritual healers. The port city of Manila quickly became the focus of Spanish activity. Located close to China, more than 20,000 Chinese came to live there. At times, tensions arose over their poor treatment by the Spanish, resulting in revolts and massacres, such as the one in 1603 when the Spanish killed, killed nearly all of the Chinese inhabitants. As was the case in the Americas, Northern Europeans were relatively late to the party in Asia. As a consequence, the Dutch and the British established very different patterns than their Iberian counterparts. The Northern Europeans benefited from superior organization of their capital resources, as well as their efficient and ruthless military capabilities. Consequently, their governments chartered private companies, in which merchants invested their own wealth and shared both the risks and rewards to create monopolies through warfare and to govern the conquered peoples. The Dutch displayed their organization, determination, and ruthlessness when they seized the Spice Islands of Indonesia in order to establish a monopoly of cloves, mace, and nutmeg. In the Banda Islands, the Dutch killed, enslaved, or let starve some 15,000 inhabitants to create a plantation-style economy. They also destroyed the crops of farmers who would not cooperate with their planned monopoly. Later, the Dutch tried to replicate this model in Taiwan, but with little success. The Dutch not only took the spice trade away from the Portuguese, but they also kept the British out of it. This forced the British to focus their activities on India, where they were faced with the powerful Mughal Empire. They learned to work with the Mughals, however, and established trading posts in Bombay, Calcutta, and Madras. From these ports, the British began importing more and more Indian cotton textiles to England. Like the Portuguese before them, the British and Dutch discovered that they could make money in the inter-Asian trade carrying goods from one place to another. They also began to ship bulk items such as pepper, textiles, tea, and coffee for a mass market. Later, these trading posts would become formal colonial possessions, a development that would have a dramatic impact in the modern era. In this map, you can see the Europeans in Asia uh, note the territory that is controlled by Portugal um, in Africa, obviously, and then they've got the trading posts that are set up throughout the Indian Ocean and into, um, the, uh, into China. Notice as well that the Spanish have the Philippines, the, all of these tiny little islands in this archipelago. The Dutch end up taking over big chunks of um, land in Indonesia. And notice that the British don't have any land. Instead, they have a series of uh, trading posts along the coast of India. Historians in general, and Strayer in particular, frequently stress changes in the early modern period, and European entry into Asian markets is indeed a new and striking development. However, we must remember that existing patterns and continuities remain. Indeed, Asian trade remained, le remained largely an Asian affair. Europeans only controlled a few pieces of territory in the islands of Southeast Asia, and the powerful states of the mainland had nothing to fear from the small European fleets. 
The Chinese expelled the Dutch from Taiwan in 1662, for example, and even the small state of Siam expelled troublesome French missionaries and colonists from Southeast Asia in 1688. Japan provides an interesting case study of Asian autonomy in this era of European expansion. As you will recall, a series of weak shoguns had plunged Japan into nearly constant civil war as various daimyos and their samurai fought with each other for land and power. During this time of chaos, the Portuguese arrived, and many Japanese welcomed them as a source of new weapons and a new faith. Indeed, some 300,000 Japanese converted to Catholic Christianity. However, with the help of European gunpowder, the daimyos of a particular clan began to get the upper hand over their enemies. Finally, in 1603, Tokugawa Ieyasu conquered and unified all of Japan, establishing the Tokugawa Shogunate. Having restored a strong central authority, Japan then set out to purify itself of what it considered to be outside influences. With this policy, Japan expelled all foreigners, executed Japanese Christians, and prohibited Japanese from traveling abroad. Only the Dutch, who as Calvinists had little interest in missionary activities, were allowed to enter a single southern port to trade and then only once a year. Thus Japan maintained strict control over its own trade. So even as the Asian economy was largely still in the hands of Asians, certain groups stood out for their entrepreneurial activity. Chinese merchants could be found throughout Southeast Asia, a region where indigenous Malay women continued to play a prominent role in the local economy. In India, a number of merchant families frequently held the upper hand in dealing with the British. And throughout Asia, Armenians were active in, the, in commerce that brought Asian goods to Europe. Even more than spices, though, silver fueled the flames of a truly global economic fire. In the 16th century, large silver deposits were discovered in Japan and South America. This set in motion a new and dynamic phase in world, hi in world economic history, exemplified in a new Pacific trading network that linked Spanish America to Manila to China. As had been the case in previous eras, China continued to be the heart of international commerce in the late agrarian period. In the 1570s, the Ming Dynasty mandated that all Chinese taxes be paid in silver. Almost overnight, the value of silver skyrocketed, providing any foreigner with silver greater purchasing power to buy Chinese goods. As a consequence, most of the world's silver ended up in China, the way water swirls around a sink before it inevitably uh, flows down the drain. Much of Spain's silver flowed west to Manila, where it was used to buy Chinese goods before entering into China proper. Likewise, silver that went east toward Europe was frequently spent on Asian imports. Spanish pieces of eight would be used as coinage throughout the world, but most would eventually end up in China. High in the Andes, Potosi was by far the world's largest silver mine. The city had a fabulously wealthy elite and a massive, impoverished population of laborers. Conditions were so bad in the mines that slaves were used and locals who were drafted in the mines were given a funeral before they left home. The impact of the mining industry was devastating to the local economy, causing pollution, deforestation, and flooding. Initially, the discovery of a massive silver mine made Spain the envy of Europe. Over time, however, this influx of, of silver led to inflation rather than real economic growth. Spanish production could not compete with imports, its aristocracy was disdainful of entrepreneurial activity, and its Catholicism did not welcome Jewish and Protestant merchants into the country. Once the price of silver fell in the 17th century, Spain quickly lost its prestige, and all of Europe experienced what historians call a general crisis. Half a world away, Japan did a much better job managing the impact of silver. The military leaders used the silver to end the warfare, establish order, foster alliances with merchants, and protect the remaining forests. The Japanese population also took measures to lower their birth rate. Together, these moves averted an ecological crisis and fostered a flourishing commercialized economy, e even as it had limited contact with the outside world. 
Indeed, Japan's silver management laid the groundwork for 19th century industrialization. Meanwhile, with the government demanding silver for taxes, the Chinese population became increasingly entrepreneurial and commercialized. Many regions began to specialize their agriculture or craft production for export to a commercial economy in order to get silver. Unfortunately, this economic dynamism took a heavy toll on the forests and sing signaled an impending ecological problem that blocked further growth. In the global economy, Europeans could not outproduce their Asian rivals. The Spanish elite in the Americas bought Chinese silk for substantially cheaper than Spanish silk, for example, and British consumers preferred less expensive Indian cotton to British textiles. Asia in general, and China in particular, was still the center of the world system, and Europeans were still rele relegated to the periphery as middlemen. In this map, uh, you can see the flow of silver worldwide. The thing to note is you've got the this giant, um, uh, there it is, uh, giant uh, deposit of silver in Potosi that is eventually going to make its way across the Pacific to Manila, where it's eventually going to go into China. But notice as well that the silver that goes to Europe, um, a great deal of it through various means also ends up in Asia, which means it's eventually going to end up in China. Notice Japan here, who also has a significant but much smaller silver uh, mine. Uh, they're di trading directly with China, and it's not going through any other middlemen. Even though silver was the primary driver of a global economic system, the discovery of North, American, of North America and the Russian penetration of Siberia, both with their massive populations of animals with desirable furs and skins, afforded these regions a seat at the table of global commerce. Europe's population grew at the same time as a cooling period, which is now referred to as the Little Ice Age. Consequently, there was even more demand for furs to keep warm. This created an incentive for Northern, Europe, Northern Europeans to begin exploration of territories in North America. The competition for furs in North America pitted rivaling European states against one another. The French, British, and Dutch all made claims to the region, but few Europeans actually hunted and trapped themselves. Rather, they set up trading posts where they bartered with Native Americans, trading European goods such as firearms and liquor for furs and skins. This intense competition led to the near extinction of several species of animals. While Native Americans did most of the labor in the fur trade, they were not forced into it and made rational market choices to get European goods. Nonetheless, the fur trade had dramatic consequences for Native American societies. The fur trade initially benefited some few tribes and groups as they gained new wealth and secured political power. However, contact with Europeans eventually led to epidemic diseases and the French-British rivaling North America increased intertribal warfare. As the Native Americans began to acquire more and more European manufactured goods, their traditional arts and crafts quickly disappeared. Moreover, alcohol had a particularly destructive and disruptive effect on Native American society. Many indigenous women married European men, helping to foster cross-cultural exchange. Most Native American women lost social status as a result of European contact, but some found small economic opportunities. As you may recall, the fur trade is what motivated the Russians to move into Siberia as they expanded their empire. There they encountered a similar situation to that in North America. The indigenous people collected the furs, disease and economic dependence spread, and animal species declined. Unlike in North America, however, the Russians had no competition in Siberia, and so they were able to extract furs as yasak, or tribute, instead of trade. In this map from your textbook of the fur trade in North America, you can see the area that is controlled by the French running along the St. Lawrence River, the Great Lakes region and down the Mississippi um, from these, the, primarily from Quebec and to uh, New Orleans, they would uh, ship those furs overseas to Paris. This area in the orange color, are, these areas are controlled by the British, 
here you can see this is pretty obviously New England and what will become the southern colonies. And in Hudson Bay, there's no problem um, getting out into the Atlantic to go to London. Over here, however, there is a bit of a problem for the British because they have to go through the French in order to get their furs to Europe. This increases the tension between the French and the British that not only plays out in North America, but indeed throughout the rest of the world. That's something we'll get into later on. I want to point out as well, notice that the Russians, uh, besides Siberia, have extended over the Bering Strait and are um, collecting furs along the Pacific coast of what is now Alaska during this time. While there is little doubt that the economic impact of the trade in spices, silver, and furs had social consequences, these pale in comparison to the profound human consequences of the Atlantic slave trade. The sheer scope and scale is mind-boggling. An estimated 12.5 million Africans taken from their homeland in a span of about three centuries. The Atlantic slave trade affected all of the societies involved. In Africa, some societies were disrupted, few were strengthened, but all were corrupted. In the Americas, the African diaspora created new societies and cultures. In Europe, profits increased and stereotypes developed. Finally, everywhere, slavery became a kind of metaphor for oppressive conditions in general. While the scope and scale of the Atlantic slave trade is staggering, it's important to remember that the practice of slavery was not new. Indeed, it has its roots in the first civilization and the classical empires. Through most of the post-classical period, the Mediterranean and Indian Ocean were main centers of slavery, with Russian and sub-Saharan African slaves as important uh, resources, so much so that the word Slav became the root word for the word slave. Much of this trade was in the hands of Muslim merchants who preferred female to male slaves by a margin of two to one. The Atlantic slave system, however, was unique for several reasons. Scale and size, as some 12.5 million Africans were sent on the Middle Passage, in which almost 2 million died before reaching the Americas. The slaves were primarily male and used overwhelmingly for plantation agriculture. Slave status became hereditary. Slaves had no rights at all, and the slaves were racially distinct Africans. Sugar plantations required an enormous labor force. Europeans learned about sugar from Muslims, whose Mediterranean sugar plantations used white slaves from Eastern Europe. When the Portuguese established sugar plantations in Brazil, they too turned to slave labor. Later, tobacco and cotton would also be grown as plantation crops worked by slaves. As the great dying made Native American labor sources scarce, uh, and Europeans had difficulty with the tropical environment and diseases, plantation owners had to look elsewhere for labor. Africa was geographic, geographically close, and the Portuguese had already discovered the existing African slave markets. The Pope himself sanctioned the slavery of Muslims and pagans. Racism also played a role. Europeans inherited some aspects of Islamic racism and surely developed their own types of racism. While there is no doubt that Europeans and their American colonies' demand for slave labor drove the Atlantic slave system, it, also, it is also the case that the actual supply of slaves is a bit more complex. As Europeans would die from exposure to African diseases, and as many African states had strong militaries, Europeans did not engage in slave raiding after an initial Portuguese effort to do so. Instead, they waited on the coasts for African slave traders to bring them human cargo from the interior. Without these African slave merchants, the Atlantic slave trade would not have been possible. African slave merchants were also active consumers of European and Indian goods. They traded humans for weapons and other manufactured items from Europe, but also for Indian Ocean cowrie shells, which they used as currency and jewelry, and Indian cotton textiles. While the horrors of being sold into slavery never changed, the numbers did. Between 1450 and 1600, on average about 400 slaves were sold or were shipped per year. 
but by the 17th century, that number would jump to over 10,000 per year. The humans who were turned into an export commodity were often prisoners of war, debtors, and criminals. The main source was the West African coast from present-day Mauritania to Angola. There was no Pan-African identity at this time. The loss of millions of people, primarily uh, working-age men, decreased African population significantly, and while some Africans profited from the slave trade, overall it stunted economic development for the continent. Involvement in the capture and sale of human beings had a corrupting effect on African societies. A curious example can be found in the Lemba cult on the Congo River. Their elite merchants who profited from slavery rigged the system to maintain their privileges. With fewer men, there were increased demands on women to produce agricultural labor. The numbers also made it possible for the growth of polygamy, and many women were bought as slaves by West African men as a sign of status and wealth. The merchant's activity of the trade did allow some women to find new niches as entrepreneurs. Some women gained wealth and status by marrying Europeans, while other women served as rulers or administrators in several African kingdoms. It is important to remember that Africans participated in a market and could choose to opt out. Benin, for example, Benin, excuse me, engaged in trade but not the slave trade. Its neighbor Dahomey, on the other hand, did enter the slave trade in a big way. In this map of the uh, slave trade, you can notice that the, uh, the width of the arrows is a uh, measure of the volume. So the wider the arrow is, the more uh, people involved in the trade. Um, notice that the greatest majority of it goes into uh, the Caribbean and Brazil. We have a tendency to think of slavery and, and cotton in, in the southern states of the United States, but if you look at the big picture, that's actually a pretty small number. Um, also notice that the, uh, the trade does involve some people going to Europe, not a whole lot, and the existing trade routes uh, into the Muslim world are also um, still there. Notice, too, that this is not quite the same thing as the triangle trade. The, the triangle trade is based on slavery, but it's something a little bit different. But that's something that we will take a look at in class. I want to thank you for joining me for this week's video lecture. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in class. Thanks again.